morning, church. So wonderful to hear your voices, greeting each other, welcoming each other. Welcome to come on in and find your spot. I won't tell you you have to sit down if you'd like to stand, if you'd like to worship. Be free to worship the Lord this morning in spirit and in truth. Amen. Those are the kind of worshipers the Lord is looking for. So let's be those worshipers this morning in reality and in truth of our hearts. Philippians 2 verse 1 says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit. So we can actually give joy to the Lord this morning, amen, by being one. Let's be one body of Christ in our worship. I just invite you to stand up, get the blood flowing, enjoy the Lord.
Why was that? You? I need a. Am I am I live? Am I live? I'm live. I can't hear myself. You guys are too loud. That's incredible. I just spent the week at youth camp, so I got no voice, and I'm pretty amped up. So I might get you to shout or dance or do something crazy today. I'm not sure, but for the moment, good morning. Well. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, it's so awesome to have each and every one of you here. Thank you for joining us online, if that's the option that you have chosen this morning. So great that you're here. Um, we do have just a couple of announcements before you, before we get you dancing and singing and praising God again. But we want to join with you in prayer. So every morning at 9.50, we actually gather in, that, in the gym right over there. We just spend a little bit of time praying. We'd love for you to join us on Sunday mornings at 9.50 in the gym. Every Sunday, we also continue that prayer ministry at 6 p.m. here at the church. Everybody's welcome. doesn't matter if it's your first time at Calvary. It doesn't matter if you're hearing online. You've never been here in person. We want to join with you at 6 p.m. here at the church on Sunday nights. Okay, so tonight, 6 p.m., we'll see you here for some prayer. It's pretty exciting, right? Uh, the other thing is uh, we just want to continue to thank you for your, uh, your continued giving and your, your offerings, your tithes, your alms. Uh, you'll see Joe at the back today. You'll see Tony at the back back. Uh, we'd love to just continue to partner with you with your finances and, and as, you, as you donate to the church and you give to us uh, as, as, as we obey God with our giving. So um, We'd love to continue that. If it's your first morning at Calvary, we don't want you to feel like you got to do that. But if, home, if this is your home, please join us in that. Uh, you'll see Tony at the back with the debit machine. You can give your cash offerings to, to Joe. We also have ways to give online through e-transfer. You can give at our website. So uh, I'm just going to take a quick minute. I know we're not taking up the offering right now, but I just want to pray for the offering and pray for the rest of our service. Is that all right? So Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for all of the things that you have blessed us with. And so, Father, we also thank you for the opportunity to um, give back to you and give back to our community and give back to our church, those things that you have so richly blessed us with. So, Father, help us this morning to, to dig right into our hearts to figure out what it is that you would like us to give and receive, whether it be of our time, our talents, of our, our finances. Father, we need you this morning, and we just pray you over this blessing that your Holy Spirit would come in a mighty way this morning here in this church, that we would receive you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. our worship to Jesus this morning, King of Kings, that in heavenly places there's worship rising, and all over the earth there's worship rising, amen, when we join in unison with one song to the King of Kings, right, isn't that an amazing thought, that as we lift our worship, we make a beautiful sound to the Creator singing at the ancient gates. There's a melody of ceaseless praise. Right? There's a throne beneath the name of names. Seated on it, one who reigns. And his kingdom now is here. Amen? And getting closer. Sing with me. There is singing at the ancient gates. There's a melody of ceaseless praise.
just begin to speak out to him now in this moment. Just begin to give him praise. Begin to give him your needs. Begin to give him the people that you love. Just give him your insecurities. Give him your anxieties. Give him your depressions. Give him the things that you need to be dropped from your life. Give him now. Just begin to call out to him. You know, we say it here fairly often, Pastor Daniel loves to say it, that every good thing begins with prayer. And we believe that the house of God, the Bible tells us that this is a house of prayer. That this is where we are to come and we're to lay our burdens down. We're here, we gotta give our family to Jesus. We have to lift up and we're just gonna take some time this morning. I don't know if there's somebody on your heart who you'd like to pray for. I don't know if you have a need in your life. I don't know what it is. Whatever it is on your heart this morning, we're just gonna take a few minutes while the band plays nice and quiet. We're just gonna begin to give to him the things that are on our heart. We're beginning to give him and, and we're gonna come to him in prayer this this morning. And so church, I just would, whether you'd like to stand, whether you'd like to sit, wherever you're most comfortable, just begin to, to call out to him, to, to, to pray to Jesus that he would heal or that he would bring home the prodigal or that he would heal you or that he would bring you to a place of rest. I don't know what it is, church. But we're going to take some time this morning. If you feel so led, reach out to your neighbor if you'd like and pray for them. Whatever it is this morning, I know that can be difficult. I know that can be scary, but we're just going to make this a house of prayer for just a few minutes this morning. Would you just give them some of your time this morning? make Jesus the focus this morning, church. He can speak into your life. He can speak into your neighbor's life. He can bring your family. Just speak out to him if it's in your head, out loud, however you'd like to do it. Just give him of yourself this morning. this morning. Just thank him for the things that you have, the family that you have, the way that he speaks into your life. Just begin to give him thanks. Call out praise in this moment. And so, Father, we're just so grateful that you are here with us. That you're here in our midst. That you're not a God that is separate from us. You're a God that resides in us and comes near to us. And Lord, I lift up each and every person in this room, each and every person online who lifted up a prayer to you or, or had somebody on their heart or needs healing. We just lift them up to you, Jesus. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would live in them and, 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 and begin to work in them and, and that they would be sensitive to what you're doing. Jesus, we ask for chains to fall, for healings to be had, for families to be repaired. We ask for all of these things not selfishly, God, but because they all make your kingdom on, on earth the kingdom it is, is, that it is in heaven. We're so grateful for what you're doing in this church. 
We're grateful for what you're doing in our lives, in our hearts, in our families. I pray for anybody who, who's going through something less than awesome this morning, God, who maybe didn't feel like praying, who maybe didn't reach out to you because there's a barrier in front of them, and I just reach out to them, reach out to you for them, Jesus. And I pray that you would replace sorrow with joy that you would bring peace where there's only disquiet. We just lift that over this church this morning. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you be in every moment of this service? And Father, we give it all to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Thank you for doing that this morning with us. Um, prayer is such an important part of the kingdom of God and, and the way that we operate with him. And God wants to partner with you in prayer. That's what prayer is. It's you partnering. It's you having a conversation with God and asking him to affect every portion of whatever's going on. You ask him in. And so just before Pastor Daniel comes up and shares the word... Um, I sort of alluded to it earlier, but for those of you who don't know, we were at Silver Birch's youth camp this past week. Come on, give it up for Silver Birch. Jeremy might be watching right now. Come on, give it up for Silver Birch's. Um, and Pastor Daniel asked me to share the highlight. Well, I couldn't decide, so I'm going to give you two. Because camp is supposed to be fun, it's supposed to be goofy, and it's supposed to be a little bit maybe rebellious. Oh, no, not that, right, George? So I wanted to share my favorite moment um, from a goofy perspective, because um, Friday night, it was a last night in camp, so I was just staying up real late, like a 34-year-old man should, uh, and was playing cards and just goofing around with some of the leaders and the coaches and the worship team, really just having that fellowship time. And then all of a sudden, the night guard comes in. And you know who's following him, guys? Samuel Boyman. Nathan Weaver. And Christian Aiken. And also Jace, who's not with us this morning, right? Probably still sleeping. Working. So they come in, and they're bleary-eyed, like they've been pulled out of bed. Because the previous night, I'm not going to share the hijinks with you. If you'd like to know, maybe they'd like to share it. I'm not sure they would. But they come in bleary-eyed. The night guard has gone to their door and banged on it and woken them up out of a deep sleep. And I'm just sitting there playing cards, and there's all these guys coming in to scrub the kitchen. They're taking apart the oven. They're taking apart everything. They're scrubbing the kitchen. They were there. I went to bed at 3.30. They had just left. And I think you guys came in at like, what, 1.30? Something like that? It was ridiculous. The night guards made them do two hours of just hard labor out of a deep sleep. It was incredible. <laughs> and I just want to go from funny to just encourage because they didn't complain once. First of all, they knew they deserved it. 100%. And I think they knew Andre was going to kill them if they did, right? But what I love about that situation was that Andre is still one of your favorite guys. I don't know, if somebody woke me up out of bed at 1.30 and then pulled me into the kitchen to do a bunch of scrubbing, I don't think they'd be my favorite person, but that's just the type of guy Andre was. And he's just a nice guy. So you guys took it like champs, but watching you guys walk in while I'm still up hanging out was just the highlight of my week, for sure. <laughs> Um, but on a more serious note, um, I went as a games maker, okay? And for those of you in my youth group know that that's not exactly my specialty or my forte. So I was really just trusting God and just say, okay, God, that's what you're bringing me for. I feel more like a coach or something like that. But what I loved about being sent as a games guy was that I actually didn't have a group of students who I was responsible for. I didn't have to check attendance. I didn't have to make sure everybody was there. I didn't make, it wasn't my fault if they snuck out of their cabins. It wasn't, I didn't do small groups. I didn't do stuff like that. So I was a lot more free to just kind of talk to whoever I wanted to and, and, and be with whoever I wanted to. So 
Monday to, Monday to Thursday was pretty loosey-goosey. I had a couple moments with the kids throughout the week praying for them and praying with them in altar times and response times. But on, thir- on Friday night, right before these numb skulls came into the, right, right, you know, had to clean the kitchen, Wayne, Pastor Wayne, uh, he's the youth director for the, dist- for, for the WOD, and he was preaching, and, and he, 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 the whole point was he wanted to, like, camp doesn't stay at camp. You got to bring it home to your own youth groups. You got to bring it home to your cities. And so he actually gave us this really beautiful, incredible time to just, the kids came to find me, and we had some time to pray for each other and, and pray for our city. And, and we're standing in a circle, and we're praying, and we're kind of popcorning it. Um, and then I just really feel the Lord say, like, listen, like, we got to pray for North Bay, yes, and we have been praying for North Bay and praying for our group, but I could just tell all week, our kids were crying on Tuesday, guys, like Tuesday of camp. You're not supposed to cry Tuesday of camp. Like, you know you're in a long week if, if, if we got Tuesday camp, right, and you're already having encounters with God. So really in that moment, I just felt like we just got to pray for each other. This is a unique opportunity. Well, it doesn't have to be a unique opportunity, but unfortunately in youth ministry, it's, you know, you got to be in the environment. So we're just there and we just pray and begin to ask people to come out and step into the middle of the circle and we all just lay hands. We all just pray at the same time. And let me tell you, every single kid, and I think we brought, what, 13? We spent 45 minutes to an hour. Everybody had left the sanctuary and we were just still there praying. And we just prayed for every single person. Um, and it was beautiful. And some people shared needs. Some people just said, listen, I just need prayer. And it was just this beautiful moment that I don't often get with the students. Um, and so when Pastor Daniel asked me about a highlight, I, I didn't even have to think about it. That was easily the highlight of my week to be able to stand with these kids and intercede with them and for them. Because that was my favorite part. It wasn't just, I get to pray for you guys all the time. But when you guys are praying for each other and you're interceding for each other as well as with each other, it's just such a powerful and special moment. And it's something that can't stay at camp. It's got to come back with us. Right? And so it was just an incredible week to, to be able to, to be there with them and to shepherd them through that. And, um, yeah, give them a hand, guys, because they did awesome. And the good news is now we know you know how to clean a kitchen, so we're going to put up a, we're going to put up a bulletin board over there, and we're going to have the four of you guys go to people's homes and clean their kitchen whenever they don't feel like doing it. Cool? <laughs> All right. Uh, the kids, you can be dismissed. Pastor Daniel's going to come on up. He's going to be able to uh, share the word with us this morning. But just now, yeah, feel free to head to your classrooms and uh, go get the word in there for yourselves. Good morning. How awesome is that? So if at any point in the middle of the night, you look around your house and you see it's a mess, call the youth. They will help you clean, right guys? Yes. Yes. Well, before we get started, actually, why don't we pray for our youth? Why don't you just extend your hand over there. One thing that I've been really feeling the Holy Spirit saying just in the last little while is we need to get earnest in prayer. We need to get passionate in prayer. That the house is a house of prayer. It's not a house of good preaching, good teaching. God said this place is a place of prayer. And so we just want to do that. We want to pray for our students. We know that they're going to be going to school again. And so with that in mind, sorry to remind you guys, um, yay parents, Um, But uh, we just want to pray for our students that God would just protect them, keep them. And they have a call on their lives, and we pray that God would just see that through. So, Father, we thank you for our students, young and old. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would protect them and keep them safe, that your hand would be upon them. These children, Lord, they're not just ours. They're actually yours. They're a gift from you, and we thank you for them. And, Lord, we pray that they would grow up strong and mighty. We pray that they would grow up with the fear of the Lord on their hearts. We pray, Lord, that they would choose you first, that you would be the first thought in their mind. Lord, they they would love you with their heart, soul, mind, and strength, Father. 
And so we just commit that to you, God. We commit these children to you. We commit their minds, their hearts, their strength, their body. Lord, it's yours that it would be uh, for your for your good, Lord, that they would just do incredible things this year and today. Guard their minds, guard their hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, today we are continuing our, our uh, series, Picture This. And uh, for those of you who are brand new, we're doing a series called Picture This, where we're essentially just talking about parables of Jesus. They're short stories that Jesus would use to explain a deeper meaning of, of things maybe that are harder to understand. Topics like heaven or, or even hell. Topics like God. Topics like um, how to live, how to love, how to serve one another. And so Jesus would tell these stories, and so today we're going to be going through uh, one of the most popular parables. In fact, I think it's one of those parables that uh, even if you have never been to church, if this is brand new to you, um, even if you haven't stepped foot in a church, a lot of people would know of this parable, this parable being the parable of the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan. So why don't we take a look at it? And uh, it's going to be on the screen here. Feel free, open up your Bibles. It's important to have the Word of God with you. It's important. Feel free to use your phones too if you want. Just stay off social media. Unless it's to do a, a hashtag saying something nice about Calvary. Then absolutely go right ahead. Luke 10, 25. We're going to go to 37. It says this, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this is an important question. A lot of the times, what is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he, the lawyer, wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho where he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, putting on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likely, uh, likewise, sorry. Now, I don't know about you. I learned this as I was doing some research for this message. But when it comes to being a good Samaritan, do you know that there are laws about being a good Samaritan? All over the world, there are laws specifically called the Good Samaritan Law. For example, there is a Good Samaritan Law that if you save someone's life... They can't sue you. Now, that's probably an interesting thought right there. You're like, I saved someone's life and they sue me? So picture this. You have a person who's choking. They're choking on a a good, I don't know, pickerel. It's really tasty. Lots of butter. It's been deep fried. It's delicious. And they're eating it. And suddenly, they start choking. And as a result, you see this. You run up to them. And you go and you start giving them the Heimlich. They spit it out, but in the process, you end up breaking some ribs, as we know that the Heimlich does from time to time, especially if you do it properly. 
It can do that. You can break ribs. Well, we have laws, there's laws all over the world, and there's actually a law in Canada, in Ontario, too, that if you save someone's life, if you gave that person the Heimlich and you happen to break some ribs, or their ribs, that they can't sue you. You're good. You're good. Now, there's actually laws, I've looked, and there's laws in other countries where you see that... um, The Good Samaritan Law goes even further than that. For example, the Good Samaritan Law in some other countries like Germany and a few others, if you don't intervene, if you don't step in when someone is in danger and try to help them and try to save them, you can actually be charged for not saving them. You can be be, um, tried for not saving their life. Now, I looked into it. I was like, well, Canada, it's one of the best places in the world. Of course we have this law. No, we do not. So you have an option. You can save the life. Don't worry. You'll be saved from lawsuit. Or you can just record it. Put it on social media. Watch someone else saving their lives. Choice is yours. But we have these laws here. But here's the reality. As Christians, as followers of Jesus... We should care. We should care. In many ways, the parable of the Good Samaritan, when we go back to our story, it's actually one of the simplest stories to understand. Very practical. The story is all about a man who showed mercy to a victim of a terrible beating and robbery. And what does the Bible say? Therefore, he acted neighborly toward the man. And Jesus is trying to teach the lawyer something very valuable. And the truth is, is he's trying to teach us something very uh, very valuable from this story too. And yet, why is it, why is it that some of the simplest things are some of the hardest things to do? Why is it some of the simplest things are the hardest things to do? For example, with my family, we have a countertop, we have dirty dishes, we have a sink, and yet it's somewhere else around the house. (laughs) Simple task of putting it in the sink. Anyone have that problem where you find cups and dirty dishes in the most random of places? I found dirty dishes in the midst of, like, two mattresses. And I'm like, I I don't get it. Now, you would look at me and you would go, yeah, totally, just put it in the sink. No. Rachel would say, Daniel, the dishwasher is right beside the sink. Why didn't you put it there? And then it's on. It's on like Donkey Kong. No, we don't get in a fight over this. But why is it that some of the simplest tasks, the simplest things to do, are the hardest? So let's unpack this story. If you've got your Bibles out, got your notes out, taking notes are important because I don't know if you're like me. I am very forgetful. And so feel free to take notes. Feel free to use your phone notes, whatever you want. Let's unpack this story because there's a lot in there. In the story, we learn that Jesus has this encounter with what the Bible says is an expert of the law. Now, this isn't someone that we would go, oh, they're like a, you know, a prosecutor. They're a lawyer. They're a defense lawyer. No, no, no. This is someone who would have been very well taught when it comes to the law, the, the, the Torah, when it comes to the Old Testament scriptures. They would have actually most likely memorized it front to back at a very young age. So this person knew everything that was in the Old Testament scriptures. They had memorized it. They had learned it. They were an, um, an expert in the law. And so you would understand that he would know all these questions. And yet this expert in the law approaches Jesus and asks a unique question. He asks the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's an important question. I think it's actually a question that all of us ask um, Sometimes on a regular basis, and, and sometimes we have these 
dark moments, we have these trying moments, and we're like, God, what do I do? What am I supposed to do? How, how do I get to heaven? How do I have that confidence that I know I'm going to heaven? And for many of us, I'll have the conversation with people where they're saying, you know, I read the Bible, I see what it says, and it just seems like a lot of do's and don'ts over and over again. Do this, don't do this. A lot of my unchristian friends, they're like, I don't know why you listen to this stuff. It's just a bunch of rules. It's a bunch of doo-doo. We know that, right? But that's not the gospel at all. If you were to read the Bible front to back, let's say just this year, front to back, you would see ways to live, rules to life, absolutely. But the truth is, one thing you would notice constantly over and over again is in the scripture, there's these powerful verses where it's like, I was, I was in darkness, I was, I was done for, I was gone, and then God saved me. I was struggling with this, and then God helped me, God healed me, God extended his love. I was down this path, and then God redeemed me. God set me straight. God helped me. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's not as, as simple as, okay, if I just do this, I'll get into heaven. I'll receive eternal life. It's so much more than this. You see, Christianity is all about what Jesus has done. It's not about what we need to do. It's what he's done. He's given his life for us on the cross, taken away our sin so that we're spotless, we're clean. Now we can have a relationship with the Father. And this expert in the law, he's asking this question, must, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So hearing the man's question, Jesus asks him, well, what does the law say? How do you read it? In other words, you're the professional, you're the smart one here, you're the lawyer, what do, you, what do you see it says? What does it say? And the man responded. He actually gives two different Old Testament verses. And he combines them together in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That was what the, law, uh, the lawyer said. You know what? I think this is how we inherit eternal life. If I love God with, with everything, and if I love people with everything, that's how I'll inherit the kingdom. That's how I'll inherit internal life. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, you're right. Do it. Go for it. Now, for some of us in the room, you're starting to think of New Testament scriptures. You're thinking of verses like Ephesians 2, where it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of anything that you've done, not your works. It's the grace of God, and it's by faith. And yet we see Jesus saying here, he's saying, yep, love God, love people with everything you got. Yeah, go for it. That's how you inherit eternal life. Now, for some of us, that confuses us right there because we're like, that doesn't make sense. That goes against everything that I've been taught, especially about Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross. And here is why Jesus gives this response. What Jesus is trying to say to people is that if eternal life depends completely on loving God with everything, loving God perfectly, and loving people with everything Loving uh, people perfectly, we're all in serious trouble. We're all in serious trouble. Why? Because none of us can love God perfectly. None of us can love God with everything. None of us can love people perfectly. None of us can love them in the way that God has asked us to love them. And remember, this is not about loving the people we like. It's also loving the people we struggle to like. That's what he's referring to. It's your neighbor that's always playing their music way too loud, way too late. It's that neighbor that always has that tiny dog that's pooping on your yard. And you're just like, it's the size of a football. I can punt that thing. 
And you're probably asking, how are those poops so big with such a small thing? I've learned that with toddlers, too. <laughs> but you're asking these questions. It's, it's those people that you're struggling to love. It's the one that cuts you off on the road. And, you know, you're thinking, you're thinking, bless them, Lord. Thank you for that, cutting me off. Just to remind me, God, that you're my hedge of protection. You're my safety, you know. We're not thinking that. It's those people to love all people perfectly no matter what. That's the verse, what the verse is saying. In 1 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul actually takes it a little bit deeper than that. He gives a little bit of a description of what he means, what this perfect love for people looks like. And he says, love is not self-seeking. Love is not self-seeking. Now, let me be the first to tell you in the room that I struggle with that. I struggle with that. In fact, um, recently I took my family to uh, Great Wolf Lodge. It's a, a water park in Niagara Falls. And we were having a blast. Like, it was awesome. Like, I was literally dad of the year. It was amazing. Right? Like, my kids were just, like, looking up at me with, like, diamonds in their eyes, just sparkling as they're like, you're the best. And I'm just like, I know, kids. Keep it coming. Right? And suddenly, uh, my, my oldest son wants to go um, on this ride, but it takes, uh, you have to get in an inner tube, and there's, uh, it's, it has, um, is a big lineup. And so we're in line waiting our turn, waiting our turn to get an inner tube so that we can go on the ride. Well, suddenly, we're next. And there's this uh, dad that comes up and he goes right in front of me. We're next. And this man comes right up in front of us with his son. And I... I, I say to him, I said, hey, you know, uh, just so you know, the line uh, starts here and it's, it's back there. And he looks at me and he goes, yup. And then he does the worst thing possible. He gives me the thumbs up. He's like, yup. And so I'd love to tell you that I was like, bless you, brother, you know. <laughs> the last shall be first. Hey, you're first. Congratulations. But the whole time in my mind, I'm thinking, he's in front of me. I could do a rear naked choke. I could take that tiny thumb and break it. I could do those things. That's what I was thinking the whole time. The whole time. Even down the ride, I was like, my oldest is like, yeah, and I'm like, the whole time. Love is not self-seeking. That man was thinking of himself and his, his kid. Me, I was thinking of myself because I was offended by what he did. You know what the funny thing is? It's my son didn't even care. He didn't. I thought I had to like fight for his honor. So I'm like, I'll make it two thumbs then, right? But he didn't even care. Love is not self-seeking. Now, some of you might think that's a bad example because you're like, you know, if I was in that situation, um, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have thought that. We'll get in line at some point. But here's the reality is all of us struggle with being self-seeking. All of us. For example, if I was going to take a picture of our church family, everyone in the room right now, and I was going to post it up there. Who's the first person you're looking at? You. If everyone was blinking, and you were the only one that wasn't blinking, you'd probably still say it was a great photo. We all struggle with not just, uh, with, with, with putting ourselves above others. We all deal with that. We look out for ourselves first. And so when Jesus is saying this, do this and you will live, if you think about it, it's almost like Jesus has a smirk on his face when he's saying, yeah, you're right, that's good, good for you, expert of the law. Do that, 
You go ahead. You do that. Go for it. You see, what he's doing in this moment is he's actually exposing the lawyer's heart. He can't live up to that. None of us can. None of us can love God perfectly. None of us can love others perfectly. And this story goes on to say that the man looked to justify himself, and so he asks, well, who's my neighbor? You notice he skips over the idea of, well, how do I love God perfectly? And he goes straight forward to justifying his actions like, like a lawyer would do by asking, well, who's my neighbor? Right? We do this all the time when it comes to Scripture. We'll exegete it. We'll exegete the, mini, uh, the meaning but excuse the ob- obligation. We'll read something and go, okay, that's what this means. It means this and this and this. But, you know, when it comes to the obligation to do it, well, you know, there's probably some other stuff that I'm missing in it. There's a reason why I can't do it. Like, you don't know what's going on in my life. This is why I can't do it right now. We do that all the time because it's hard. We try and get ourselves off the hook, and this is what the lawyer is doing. The lawyer doesn't love God perfectly. He doesn't love his neighbor perfectly, but he thought he could put the pressure off by debating who actually qualifies as a neighbor. So he's probably thinking, as a good Jew would, he's like, who's my neighbor, my brother or sister right beside me? A fellow Jew, someone who is directly in my um, my family, someone that I love, someone that I like. He's trying to use this as an example. But Jesus turned the problem around. You see, he doesn't answer the lawyer's question. Instead, he tells a story of a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho who, who was jumped. He was beaten and robbed by a group of robbers. And three men come along. And we learn that the first man that came along was a priest. Luke 10, 31, it was a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by the other side. Now, you have to understand that a priest is someone who had these religious duties. At that time, they were doing these sacrifices to God. And so if a Jew happened to come across someone who had died, they couldn't be there around them. They couldn't be around the body. In fact, actually, if you look at the, at the New Testament, you'll see that when Jesus um, rose from the dead and the disciples ran to the tomb, one of the disciples actually didn't go into the tomb. He stopped at the tomb, but then Peter ran in. You see, why did he stop? He stopped because it would make him unclean. There was this belief that when you were unclean, you couldn't, do, you couldn't be a part of the, uh, the worship, you couldn't be a part of the ceremonies. And so right here, you have this priest who sees this man, and he goes, well, I can't be unclean. That's probably what happened. I have responsibilities, I have duties to do, there's things that I have that day, I can't get dirty, even though it's a fellow Jew. And so the Bible tells us that he went around. And the Bible says that there was a Levite that showed up. This is also a religious man who would have been um, probably a part of the same lineage. Levites, they served in the temple, but they were also priests. Some were priests, some just served. And so this Levite, same thing. He sees this man, and the Bible says that he goes around him. And then the Bible goes into an interesting talk here. You see, both the people that we expected that would do something... Those who feared God, who were called to love God and love people, both of these men didn't in that moment. They didn't do anything. But we see that the the third person, which is a Samaritan, did something different. Now, you need to understand, Samaritans at that time were not loved by the Jews. In fact, Samaritans were a result of the Syrian army. One day, 750 years before this time, this story, the Assyrians attacked the northern kingdom of Israel and defeated it. And as a result, like most kingdoms would do when they attacked a nation and won, they would take the people, move them elsewhere, and then bring other people and plant them there. 
And so what happens in this moment is suddenly one of the worst things that you can do as a Jew happens. You see, there were still stragglers. There were still people that were left there in the city. And so those ones started intermarrying with Assyrians, with these other people. And so as a result, they had children that weren't fully Jewish. And so right there, you have these people that it's like, oh, you know what, like they're not one of us. They're not fully Jewish. They're only part Jewish, right? They're not fully like us. Now, to make matters worse, because of that tension going on there at that time, the the Samaritans, they actually started in in a different mount. They started, they they made a place of worship and and a place that wasn't fully like the worship that the Jews did in Jerusalem. It wasn't happening in the same way. And so not only was there tension over the fact that they weren't fully Jewish, but now there's tension that there's religious practices that are not lining up with what the Torah says, what the, what the Old Testament scriptures. So there was a serious hatred between this. So you can imagine the lawyer hearing this story and saying the two people that you expect to do something didn't. And then the one person that you were like, no way they would do anything. They did something. And for a Jew, of all things, it said that the Samaritan saw him and took pity on him. He bandaged him and he put oil on him to help with his wounds. And he, he get, got him to ride on his donkey to an inn where he told the innkeeper to care for him, to watch over him, and that he would pay for any extra expenses that he may have. The Samaritan, what's amazing is the Samaritan was not put off by the fact that this was a Jew. Even though it would have been a great great inconvenience for him. Not just for time, not just because, you know, time is money, places to go, things to do. And especially in those areas, when you're going from Jerusalem to Jericho, that's dangerous ground. There was robbers there all the time that were looking to to attack people. And yet this Samaritan inconveniences himself. One thing I always say, if it's important, it's not inconvenient. It's not. You know, the truth is, is sometimes we have places to go and we have things to do. But the reality is, is sometimes... We also have to get our hands dirty and do something that we didn't expect that day. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. The Bible says, be led by the Spirit. You know, there's times where I know that I have things to do, and then there's moments where I feel the Holy Spirit saying, not today. I need you to do this. I want you to go here. And it's not something that just a pastor hears or just a worship leader hears or just, you know, someone who serves. All of us can hear God. All of us can hear God. The question is, is are are you walking in step? Are you positioned to be in a place where you're listening? And so this good Samaritan was willing to inconvenience himself. This was an inconvenience of both time and money. Two things that we're not necessarily fans of of wasting or or using differently than what we wanted. We like our time. We like our money. Especially in the summertime, being in North Bay, because we know that winter is going to come soon, and it's going to hit hard. And so our time and our money are valuable. And yet what we see in this passage is that that's not an excuse to not help. That's not an excuse to not get dirty and do something different that the Lord is leading you to. Jesus then asked the question to the lawyer in verse 36. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? You see what Jesus did right there? You see the question that he asked? The lawyer was asking in the form of, an object. Well, who's my neighbor? He's talking about an object. Who's my neighbor? Is it this Jew? Is it that Jew? Is it the person who lives right beside me? Is it the person that I go to church with and I sit on the pew with? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus, he takes it away from being an object and he moves it to being a subject. 
He didn't answer who is my neighbor, but rather who is the one who acts neighborly. He was asking the lawyer, do you act neighborly to people in need? And if you notice, the lawyer hates this because it's a Samaritan. And when Jesus asks who was more neighborly, he's not even able to announce it. He says this, he says, the one who showed mercy. He can't even come, come out to say that, you know, it's, it's actually the Samaritan. He has to say it's the one who showed mercy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. You know, many of us look, in, look at this parable when we read it and we go, okay, well, that's what the parable is about. It's showing love to people. It's showing mercy to people. I just have to be merciful. If I can do that, I can get to heaven. I'll inherit eternal life. But remember, that's not the important question that was asked. The lawyer at the beginning asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The truth is, is what this parable shows is that we can't act perfectly in love. What I do isn't enough to get me into heaven You see, what this parable does is it teaches us that we need Jesus. We need Jesus. We need a Savior who is perfect to do it for us, to show us, to help us. Jesus is the answer for eternity because we can't love God perfectly. We can't love people perfectly. He died for our sins, and as a result, we now respond out of love that we see he has given us. We've experienced through him. If you want to love people like Jesus loved people, you have to love Jesus. And that only flows out of a relationship with him. Perfect love only flows out of a personal relationship with Jesus. And he gives us an example. Remember, we love because he first loved us. And we reflect that to others. John 13, 34, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Remember, this is bigger than any other commandment that he's, he's, we see in the Old Testament. He's saying, I'm giving you a new one. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. You see that? Just as I have loved you. I've shown you. Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. You see that? It's him who helps you to will and to act to fulfill those good purposes. It's a relationship with Jesus that will give us the capability to love the unlovable. It only flows out of a relationship with him. We need Jesus. And Jesus challenges the lawyer, and it also challenges us today. When the lawyer says, who's my neighbor? Another way to look at this is, or at least we think it is, we think this is it. Who should I love? Or how many people should I love? Maybe in hopes of limiting the obligation. But what Jesus is doing with the lawyer and what Jesus is asking of us is not who is my neighbor, who should I love? It's actually do I love? That's what this this does is it exposes our heart and it says do you love? Do you show love? Never mind who, because the reality is if you do love, then you'll be able to love anyone at any time. Do you love? You see, Christ is showing, Christ is showing that love tra- uh, transcends nationality. Love transcends race. Love transcends religion. It transcends prejudice things we assume of others. It transcends that. This story makes us look at our heart. Band, you can come up. It makes us look at our heart and ask the question, is there anyone that I hate? Is there anyone that I drive by and when I see them, I cringe? 
Is there anyone at work or in the home that when I look at them, I see them or I think about them, I start thinking bad thoughts? I start thinking the worst. Is there anyone in my life like that? And remember, 1 John 4, 12, or 20, it says, if someone says I love God but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God who we can't see? Now, you might be in the room thinking, well, I don't hate this person. I just really dislike them. <laughs> and the Bible would suggest saying, well, then you don't really love God. We need to have a heart for people, and a heart for people is a result of a heart for God. Where's your heart today? Where's your heart? When the lawyer was asked who is neighborly, his response was the one who shows mercy. We don't only, we don't only need Jesus this parable teaches us, but it actually teaches us that we need mercy and we need to extend mercy to others. Because we see it in Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Mercy is important. God has been merciful to us, and so we need to extend mercy to others. Finally, Jesus shows us that we need to give whatever is needed, needed, even at the cost of time, of our treasure, all those things, even at personal cost. I'm always reminded in Matthew 25, this moment where um, Jesus is talking about uh, that final day where we stand before him and he, he judges us. He looks at our lives and he goes, okay, let's see what you did in your life. And he has this moment in, in, verse, uh, in chapter 20, uh, 25. It says, the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of this world. Look at this. It says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. In verse 40, the king replied, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. And the Bible says that the righteous will inherit the kingdom. That shows us that true followers of Jesus, those things don't necessarily make us disciples or followers of Jesus, but their absence clearly shows what we are and what we're not. We need Jesus. What this parable teaches us, we need Jesus. We need a savior. We need mercy. We need to extend mercy we need to be neighborly, extend it to those who are loved and extend it to those who the world thinks are unlovable. And we need to give whatever is needed. When you look at this parable, it's not just uh, eternal significance, but this parable is also practical advice. Because what does Jesus say to the lawyer? Go and do likewise. Friends, Go and do likewise. Father, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that um, inheriting eternal life isn't a result of do's. Do this, do that, don't do that. Because we'll fall short every time. I fall short all the time. We all fall short. And yet, Father, it was when we were sinners in our lowest points that you gave your life for us. 
and you gave us a perfect example of what it means to love God perfectly and love you and uh, your people perfectly. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that we would, through a reflection of you, through you living inside of us, your spirit working inside of us, Father, that we would be able to love the unlovable, that we would show mercy, that we as a church would be neighborly to our brothers and sisters, those who the world um, loves, but also those the world hates, those that we agree with and even those that we disagree with. God, that we would love your people, that we would love that we would show mercy. God, that the defining thing of our extending mercy and extending love wouldn't be politics. It wouldn't be religious views. It wouldn't be location or vocation. It wouldn't be style. It wouldn't be wealth. It wouldn't be any of those things, Father. Lord, but the thing that would be uh, uh, that would make us want to extend mercy and extend love and be neighborly to others, Lord, it wouldn't be defined by race or anything like that, but Father, that it would be defined by your Son. Lord, it would be defined by your love for people, your love for the lost. God, you are willing to go all out. And so I pray, Father, that we would too. We would go and do likewise. We would do what you've done. And so, Father, we need your strength. We need your guidance. We need Jesus. We need you. Amen.
We need Jesus, we need mercy, and to extend mercy, we need to go and do likewise. Friends, do not underestimate the power of prayer, the power of reading your Bible every day. It is the best inconvenience of your life. <laughs> I know some of you might heard that statement and you're like, I don't like that. It's the best. Because we have a city in need. We have people in the room in need. Online. That need Jesus. Jesus. And you can be that good Samaritan to them. So Father, I pray that as we go throughout this week, God, that we would look at our own hearts. And ask the question, do I love? Do I truly love? And Father, if we don't, Father, I pray that we would just look to you. We need you, Jesus, because we can't do it on our own. It's hard to love people who make it hard to love. So teach us how to love. Show us the extent of your mercy and your grace, the extent of your love, so that we can reflect that on others. In our coming and our going, Father, that we would exemplify you. And be a light to those who are beaten, who are bruised, who've been robbed, who are struggling, who are in need. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining us. Remember, feel free to get an inconvenience your night and come to prayer tonight at 6 o'clock. Thank you so much for your generosity and giving. Uh, there'll be a, a tithing plate is in the back if you're brand new. Feel no obligation to give. But if you do call the church home, then we ask that you would give. There's also the tithing machine in the back. God bless and have a wonderful day.